So the first question you were going to ask me was, what concerns you about the way Buddhism's often taught and presented? I, I should say, first of all, there's no need to take any notes or anything like that, because Carenza can send you out the notes uh, from what I'm going to say. So the way Buddhism is taught or presented, I think there are at least three difficulties here. The first difficulty is that we're familiar with the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And we perhaps subconsciously expect other religions to be the same kind of thing, the same kind of shape. So we expect to find doctrines to believe, scriptures seen as divine revelation, and central figures, which we might call prophets or a savior, who are representatives of a single God who created the world. Almost none of this works for Buddhism. The, the Buddha himself was a, a teacher rather than a prophet or savior. And Buddhism, Buddhism is basically atheistic. There's no creator God, no narrative of creation or of judgment at the end of time. Certainly there are Buddhist scriptures <laughs> and they are, they are truly vast. Um, I have here the long discourses. This is uh, this contains three of the 50 volumes of the Pali Canon. And there are another 50 volumes of the Chinese Canon and over 100 volumes of the Tibetan Canon. But, but none of these are divine revelations. They're either directly the teachings of the Buddha or the monastic rules or the philosophical and psychological teachings which were developed later on. But at least, so that leaves us with doctrines. The Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path. So that's what Buddhists believe. At least we're on solid ground here, surely. Well, no, not really, not even here. The Buddha told people not to rely on traditional teachings or on scriptural authority or on argument or analysis or even the respect for a charismatic teacher. He even told them not to take his own teachings on trust, but to test them out for themselves in their own experience. So even the Four Noble Truths are not truths to be believed, but more teachings to be explored and actions to be taken. The Eightfold Path isn't really a set of doctrines, but if you like, a journey of morality and meditation, which will eventually, hopefully, lead to wisdom. Very different from what we're, what we're familiar with. The second difficulty is that, is that Buddhist categories don't really fit into our Western religious vocabulary. We're familiar with important terms such as uh, sin and forgiveness, grace and redemption, none of which really appear in Buddhism at all. Even, even the basic Buddhist worldview uh, feels very strange to us. Uh, the three underlying characteristics of dukkha, anicca and anatta all present problems. Dukkha is often uh, translated as suffering, not a good translation. Even experienced commentators tell, uh, tell us that the Buddha taught that life is suffering. He taught no such thing. He did teach that everything within our experience has an element of dukkha, of unsatisfactoriness about it, simply because of the, the second characteristic, anicca, impermanence, if you like. Nothing lasts. Everything is impermanent and subject to change, according to Buddhism, from our bodies and our minds to the, the mountains and the continents. It's just that they change so slowly that uh, we can't see it happening. And if everything is impermanent, that includes us. The teaching of Anatta is that we have no permanent fixed self, nothing we can call an eternal soul. Again, very different from what we're familiar with from the, the Abrahamic religions. Some people have thus argued that with no uh, no creator God, no soul, no divine revelation, no doctrinal orthodoxy. Buddhism isn't really a religion at all, but a, uh, an atheistic philosophy. But then 
what other philosophy has got monks and nuns chanting in monasteries and temples? What other philosophy has meditation at its center? Uh, what other philosophy has its own art and architecture? The third difficulty is that Buddhism is extremely varied. It began 25 centuries ago in Northern India, has spread throughout much of Asia, and more recently into, into Western countries as well. But unlike Christianity and Islam, which often tempted to, uh, shall we say, supersede or even wipe out indigenous beliefs, Buddhism has always looked for some kind of uh, accommodation with the existing religions of each new country it entered. So the Buddhism of Southeast Asia looks quite different from the Buddhism of Tibet, which has been influenced by the earlier Bon religion, and, and quite different again from Japanese Buddhism, which has again been influenced by the indigenous uh, Shinto tradition. It, even the more conservative and monastic Theravada Buddhism has quite different, what should I say, quite different flavors in Sri Lanka and Thailand and Burma, Myanmar, again, because of the different cultural settings and different previous beliefs. As for the later Mahayana tradition, with more emphasis on compassion and wisdom and with more involvement of lay people, um, it again varies from country to country and within each country as well. Uh, there are four different schools of Tibetan Buddhism, two different Japanese Zen schools, and then further traditions uh, like, like Pure Land Buddhism. <coughs> Excuse me. In the last century, all these traditions uh, have been brought into the West where Asian immigrants and European converts like me uh, often view their Buddhism differently. Those with an Asian background tend to wish to keep the traditional Buddhism of their mother country alive, whereas uh, those uh, Westerners may be happy to, or more happy to combine the teachings and practices of different Buddhist traditions. There's also the question of change through time as a, a small movement in Northern India gradually became the more or less the predominant religion of Asian countries, one after the other. The original uh, predominantly democratic organization uh, in time became more of a monastic hierarchy with monks also valued much more highly than nuns in, in patriarchal societies. Even the original atheistic approach began to change as the reverence shown to the Buddha became more and more pronounced. So that in popular Buddhism, it looks very much like worshiping a semi-divine being. Again, this is not what the Buddha taught. So summing up this bit, because we're so familiar with Christianity, because Buddhist categories are so different from Christian teachings, and because of the, the sheer variety of Buddhist traditions, it can be difficult for us in the West to explain to ourselves and then to each other what Buddhism is all about. Right, fabulous. Thank you, Robert, for that overview of all the complexity of it and all that's going on there. Um, there are some questions coming in and that's really fabulous. Thank you. So do keep putting those into the chat and we'll come to those at the end. So having outlined all the complexities, um, the, the question is, what might be a better way of framing our approach to the diverse family of traditions um, commonly grouped together as Buddhism? And one of the questions actually in the chat is a good one asking, how do we refer to Buddhism? What is the best way to do that? Mm, I'll take that one first. Um, we can refer to it to, uh, as Buddhism. We can refer to it as different Buddhist traditions, the Zen Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, Buddhists themselves tend to talk about the Dharma, uh, but that, that is a sort of internal word. So if we're looking in from outside, we would say Buddhism or the Buddhist tradition or Zen Buddhism or the Zen tradition. Doesn't matter too much. So a better way of framing our approach. Uh, let's let's start by looking at the way we describe religions 
the way we look at their different aspects. Again, taking Christianity as our familiar example, we talk about Christian doctrine, Christian scriptures, Christian worship, Christian ethics. We might also look at the experience of being a Christian, what it means for the individual. The, uh, and then the, the social organization of Christian churches and their hierarchy is also relevant. And also the, the variety of Christian iconography and symbolism from a, a simple cross worn around the neck to a, to, a, to a vast cathedral. I've deliberately introduced these seven aspects in a rough order of importance for Christianity, doctrine and orthodoxy, scripture and revelation, worship and prayer, ethical behavior, and so on. But although each aspect is relevant for each religion, the order of importance may be very different in each case. This underlines how Buddhism is fundamentally different from Christianity. Uh, when, when I tell people I'm a Buddhist, they usually ask, what do Buddhists believe? At first, I would answer by telling them about the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. But eventually, I came to think that this is the wrong question to begin with. It would be much better to start by asking, what do Buddhists do? And this is also a little bit more visual. Uh, you can you can show some of what Buddhists do, whereas what Buddhists believe is a, a conceptual thing. How do Buddhists practice? If the Buddhist path is one of morality, meditation and wisdom, ethics and practice naturally come uh, before doctrine and scripture. We might begin by looking at the five precepts, the moral guidance common to all Buddhist traditions. These are not uh, commandments, of course, although they sound a bit like commandments, but they're not commandments because in Buddhism, there's nobody to do the commanding. They're much more like training rules, and that's the way they're phrased. They're familiar to all Buddhists. I undertake the rule of training to avoid, to avoid harming living beings, to avoid taking what is not given, to avoid misusing the senses, to avoid false speech and to avoid drink and drugs which cloud the mind. Now, does this mean that Buddhists are all pacifist vegetarians, scrupulously honest in word and deed, always faithful to their spouses or partners and strictly teetotal? Well, no, probably not. But they would at least respect people who do behave like this. Each of these precepts is both a negative and a positive thing, a warning and an encouragement, if you like. Instead of harming living beings by killing them or having someone else kill them so that we can eat their flesh or just being mean and nasty to them, we should develop loving kindness towards them. Instead of stealing from others or, or cheating them, we should develop generosity towards them. Instead of misusing our senses, yes, this is mostly about sex, uh, not just immoral sexual behavior, but it could be gluttony. It could be an obsession with music. You'd be um, misusing your hearing. Um, instead of these things, we should develop, what would we say, faithfulness, contentment, self-restraint. Instead of lying and deceiving people, we should develop truthfulness in all we say and do. And instead of indulging in alcohol or drugs, we should develop the ability to keep the mind clear. It's that clarifying, clarifying of the mind, which is important to Buddhism. So after a glance at Buddhist ethics, we might choose to look at meditation as the essential spiritual practice of being a Buddhist. But this raises more problems. There are many, many different way, forms of meditation based on either calming the mind or developing insight or both together. Perhaps we might describe how Buddhist meditators often focus on the breath, but describing this is very different from experiencing it. What happens when we tell the mind to stop doing what it's doing and pay attention only to the breathing? Well, you'll only know if you try it. It is an experiential thing. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that many Asian Buddhists don't meditate 
but keep to the five precepts as their main ethical practice and also visiting monasteries to make offering, offerings to support the monks and nuns. Okay, if morality and meditation lead to wisdom, what is this wisdom? What's the goal of Buddhism? Enlightenment? Nirvana? I, I've read serious commentators who say that Nirvana is the extinction of the soul. Nothing could be further from the truth. But again, describing Nirvana is almost impossible. One might say that the goal of Buddhism is awakening, awakening to things as they really are, rather than as we would wish them to be, or as we would mistakenly fear them to be. In that sense, we might say that Nirvana is the the waking up to the present moment, the waking up to what's going on. It's very often assumed that Nirvana is only achieved after many lifetimes. And you'll see that in the Buddhist scriptures, in the endless cycle of rebirth. And the dictionary calls it a transcendent state. But time and again, the Buddha himself says that Nirvana is available here and now, not like some kind of Buddhist heaven in the in the far off future. The Buddhist teachings were transmitted orally by the monks and nuns for several centuries before being written down. And again, each tradition has its own scriptures. Uh, these may sometimes be added to centuries after the Buddha's time. And the, the writings or sayings of other teachers may also be seen as scriptures. Although they're not scriptures of divine revelation, they may be regarded with equal reverence by both monastics and lay people. Again, we're not too familiar with this. We think of the canons of scriptures being laid down in the early period, but the workings of a writer like Dogen, for example, a 13th century Zen monk, um, his writings are still seen as scriptures within the Zen tradition, although they're uh, a, a thousand years and more after the Buddha more than a thousand years after the Buddha. Again, Buddhist art and architecture are rich sources of symbolism, from a simple wrist mala, like so, um, to a vast monastic complex. Again, the style reflects each different tradition and each different country. Having said all that, one interesting way of presenting or teaching Buddhism is to visit some Buddhists. Uh, most towns and cities will have a Buddhist group of some sort, uh, although, of course, they may be Theravada or Tibetan or Zen. They may be Asian or convert. They may be traditional or westernized. No group is typical of Buddhism as a whole. In the Northeast, we're extremely fortunate in having th monastic centers representing all the three main traditions. In Northumberland, there's the Theravada Ratanagiri Monastery near Belsay, and the Zen Throttle Hole Buddhist Abbey near Carshield. Over the border in Scotland, near Eskdale Muir, is Sami Ling, the oldest and largest Tibetan monastic center in Europe. They're all very different. I, I've been welcomed on retreat at all three, and they also welcome school and college visits. They're very amenable. These three traditions, Theravada, Tibetan and Zen, usually have friendly relations with each other. If you find yourself visiting a more modern Buddhist organization, I name no names, um, you just might find them telling you that they are the only true Buddhists. This might remind you of more familiar sectarianism. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, there are other groups in the Northeast which maybe fall between the two areas and as um, they have the more uh, active outreach, but we can come to that a little bit later. There are some fantastic questions coming into the chat, so I'm delighted with those. We'll address those later. Okay, so if you've gone through what's not a good approach and you've gone through what might be a more practical approach in your view, what would you like um, teachers and students to understand about a Buddhist worldview? And there was a really appealing question from Katie earlier on in the in the chat. Katie, do you want to ask your question now, just before Robert jumps in? 
I'm not sure she's there. Yeah, go on. Kitty? I can see you've unmuted yourself, but we can't hear you. Uh, so I'll tuck it in. It was basically, what would you as a Buddhist want young people to know specifically about your tradition and practice, given that curriculum time is limited and therefore we have to be selective? So if you would go through what would you like people, teachers and students to know about a Buddhist worldview, and then maybe think about that particular question in terms of narrowing things down, where would it take you? Okay, sure. Uh, from a first of all, from a personal point of view, uh, you should know where I'm where I'm coming from. Um, I, <laughs> I I hesitate to say this, but I became a Buddhist in the year the Beatles split up, uh, and practiced in the Theravada tradition for nearly thirty years until I became uncomfortable with the emphasis on lay people supporting a central monastic community. So I moved to a Zen tradition where monastic and lay life were seen as different but sort of equally important ways to practice. But eventually I became uncomfortable again with uh, an ancient monastic hierarchy. It, it seemed to me at odds with the more democratic approach of contemporary Western society. So now I'm what I call an unofficial Buddhist, no longer part of a specific tradition. That is the, that's the title of the book I've just finished writing, The Unofficial Buddhist, trying to explore how to practice outside the traditional monastic schools of Buddhism while still drawing inspiration from them. There were probably more unaffiliated Buddhists than those attached to Theravada, Tibetan or Zen organizations in the West. I, I still visit my local Zen group every week and we host a more unofficial group each month. I, I'll always be grateful to the monks and nuns who've supported my practice, but a more secular, this worldly approach seems more appropriate for me now. In terms of more generally how how to describe Buddhism, how to describe Buddhism in a nutshell. Um, Buddhists are often defined as those who take refuge in the three treasures, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. They take the Buddha as their enlightened teaching, teacher, his teachings as their guide, and the monastic community as wise and compassionate exemplars to follow. Each of these could be interpreted more broadly outside traditional Buddhist schools. Unofficial Buddhists in the West may prefer to take, Buddha, take refuge in the Buddha as the potential awakening of all beings, in the Dharma as the ocean of wisdom and compassion, and in the Sangha as the interdependence of, of all beings. Um, I could finish by giving you Buddhism in a single verse. If you want Buddhism in a single verse, it's very easy. There's only three things that Buddhists have to do. Avoid all harmful actions of body, speech and mind. Practice skillful actions of body, speech and mind. And awaken your compassionate heart. And you've got it. Thank you very much, Robert. That's a very uh, whirlwind tour of all those different areas. And I think the presentation reflects how much thought you've given to it.